Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, we're doing another Kahoot, and we're going to be covering blood disorders for the LPN, LVN student. Before we get started, as always, I'm going to ask you to please support me and support this channel by liking this video. You're going to love it. Go ahead and give it a thumbs up now. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already, and don't forget I'm now offering Next Generation NCLEX Review Sessions. Part one and part two, you can reserve your spot by going to my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. If you're a current nursing student you're, not student, you're not studying for boards, you're just trying to pass your exams, you're just trying to get through the program. I've got audio lessons that would be very beneficial to you. Again, you can check those out by going to my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Almost daily, you can find me covering a variety of nursing topics across my social media platforms such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. Be sure to check me out. The handle is Nexus Nursing. Now, without any further ado, guys, let's get started. Blood disorders for the PN student. First question. Your patient's erythrocytes are below normal. Which would most likely cause a reduced red blood cell count? Would it be mitral valve prolapse? Would it be ventricular tachycardia? Would it be peptic ulcer disease or would it be BPH, benign prosthetic hypertrophy? What do you guys think? Okay, very good. Most of you guys chose the correct answer, peptic ulcer disease. Why? Think about it. If a patient has peptic ulcer disease, what is a major complication of peptic ulcer disease that we're going to be concerned about? Bleeding, hemorrhage, that person bleeding out. And obviously if that person's bleeding out, those RBCs are going to do what? Go down. The RBCs are going to be low. Very good. All right, which statement made by your patient is most likely related to their new diagnosis of anemia? Would it be that they fainted at school? Would it be that they suffer from migraines? Would it be that they had an appendix removed three years ago or that their abdomen is tender? Which one would be most likely related to the diagnosis of anemia? Very good. They fainted at school. Remember, um, if the person is anemic, you have to remember hemoglobin that's carried in the RBC. That's what carries the oxygen. Okay. So if that's low, that means that oxygen's not getting to the tissues the way that it's supposed to. The patient that is anemic, very often they'll complain of, or they'll report symptoms, excuse me, they'll report symptoms of weakness, of dizziness, of fainting. And that is because of the anemia. Because remember, um, hemoglobin is responsible for bringing oxygen to the tissues, including what? The brain. All right, which lab result is most indicative of anemia? Would it be a red blood cell count with a 4.8 million? Would it be a red blood cell count of 5.2 million? Would it be a hemoglobin count of 9.2 or a hemoglobin count of 12? Very good. Hemoglobin of 12. So guys, normal hemoglobin should be between 12 to 17, depending on the gender, but that's your range, right? And I already told you hemoglobin is an RBC. Hemoglobin is a type of protein that attaches to the red blood cell. And that is what delivers oxygen to all of the tissues. So uh, when we're looking at this, guys, if I told you that hemoglobin normal is, you know, between 12 and 17, depending on your gender, nine, look how low that is. Now, when we're looking at um, the RBCs, RBCs normals like around 4.7 to uh, 5.2 million. So RBC, the RBCs that we're looking at here, that's normal. 
actually 4.7 to about 6.2 million. That's what's normal for your RBCs. But regardless, the numbers I put on the screen, that is fine for the RBC. The only thing that would be abnormal here is the hemoglobin count. Okay, when you're administering an iron tablet, which drink would be most appropriate to offer the patient? Would it be water, milk, tea, or orange juice? So you're giving your patient an iron tablet. Which drink would you offer to them to take with that iron tablet? Very good, orange juice. Vitamin C, that ascorbic acid, that's what's needed for the iron to be absorbed. Very good. Okay, you're teaching your patient about liquid iron preparation. So it's not a tablet, the patient's getting the iron in liquid form. What information would you provide to the patient about this? Would you tell them to use a straw when taking this medication? Would you tell them to take this medication over ice? Would you tell them to drink this medication warmed? Or would you tell them to drink this medication with fat-free milk? Which teaching would you provide? Very good. You're going to tell them, remember, this is liquid iron. You're going to tell them to take uh, drink it through a straw because remember, iron is very staining. We don't want the patient to stain their teeth. A couple other things. Don't forget, it's very important. You need to know about iron. It's very constipating. So you're going to tell the patient to drink lots of fluids. You're going to tell them to exercise and move about. We want them to ambulate. You're going to tell them to eat foods that are high in fiber. You're going to warn them that their stool is going to turn a very dark color because if you don't warn them, they'll freak out. And by the way, just uh, with mention of milk, guys, um, milk actually de decreases absorption of iron. Okay, so we definitely don't want patient taking iron with milk. I think I mentioned this several times, you know, if I have a pediatric patient and their labs come in and I see the hemoglobin's low, the patient looks like they're anemic. Guess what? One of my first questions to the parents are, how much milk is this child drinking? Because milk decreases absorption of iron. So you definitely don't want to give milk with iron. Okay, you have to administer iron dextrin 100 milligram parentally. How should it be administered? Subcutaneously, intramuscularly, intradermally, or intravenously? How would you give it? Wow. <laughs> okay, so most of you guys chose IV. You're going to give the iron IM. We're going to give it IM. And let me be specific how we're giving it IM. Deep, 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 deep in the muscle, okay? We need that medication to be absorbed. We're giving it IM. And you're going to use Z-Track method. That is something else that you need to know when it comes to um, parental administration of iron. You're giving a Z-Track method for two reasons. Number one, iron is very irritating. And number two, it'll stain. So you want to give it deep IM and also use Z-Track method. Which nursing intervention is priority for the patient in sickle cell crisis? What are you going to address? What's priority to address? Is it nutrition? Is it pain? Is it ventilation? Or is it anxiety? Which would be your priority to address in a patient that is in sickle cell crisis? Very good. Most of you guys got the answer correct. It's pain. It's pain. This patient is in extreme pain because what's happening? Tissue ischemia. The problem is not oxygenation. The problem is not ventilation. The patient's breathing. 
The patient has oxygen. The oxygen's in the hemoglobin. The hemoglobin's in the RBC. The RBC's there in the blood, right? That's not the problem. The problem is that the RBC that carries the hemoglobin, that carries the oxygen is what? It's sickled. Instead of being that nice round shape, it's sickled and they tend to clump up together. And before you know it, you've got obstruction. And now that oxygen that's already there in the blood can't go to the tissues. It can't get there like it's supposed to. And it causes extreme pain for the patient. So you have to address pain. Pain never killed anyone except for five situations. I will keep preaching this to the day I die. I'm telling you guys, you need to know this for test purposes. Pain is not a priority unless the patient has one of these five diagnoses. Sickle cell. Myocardial infarction, burns, cancer, and stones. And it doesn't matter. It could be kidney stones, gallbladder stones. If the patient's got stone pains, it's a pain is a priority, okay? All right. Select all that apply. Sickle cell crisis can be triggered by which precipitating factors? Here are your choices. This. Hypoglycemia, overexertion, smoking, overhydration, dehydration, fever. Select all that apply. Sickle cell crisis can be triggered by which precipitating factors? The code to get in is 987434. Nine eight seven four three four. All right, so let's talk about this. Guys, when a patient has an increased demand for oxygen, that's going to be a precipitating factor. Why would that be a precipitating factor? Again, it's not that the patient doesn't have oxygen. They have oxygen. The problem is the oxygen can't go where it needs to go because those cells become sickled, right? So let's talk about these precipitating factors, not hypoglycemia. We don't want our patient to be hypoglycemic, but that's not a precipitating factor. Overexertion, yes. Because if you've overexerted yourself, guess what your body will demand more of? Oxygen. Smoking, yes. Because what does smoking do? Smoking causes vasoconstriction, right? So we decrease or limit the oxygen that's going to the tissues. Overhydration, no. We want our patients to be very hydrated. Those patients who have sickle cell disorder, what do we teach them? We teach them to always drink water, to walk around with a bo water bottle and to drink extra water if they're going to be out in the hot sun, if they're going to be sweating, if they have a fever. We don't want that patient to get dehydration, dehydrated. So overhydration is not a choice. But yes to dehydration, absolutely, that's a precipitating factor. And of course, fever absolutely is a precipitating factor. All right, your patient's crying because she's just been diagnosed with leukemia. What would be the best nursing response? Would it be, I'm sorry that this is upsetting. Why are you crying? You seem terribly upset. Think positive thoughts. Which would be the most appropriate response to your patient crying because she's just been diagnosed with leukemia? I'm happy most of you guys got this right. You seem terribly upset. What are you doing? You're making an observation, right? And that is a form of therapeutic communication. So you make that ob observation and then you shut your mouth and you allow them to process that thought and they answer you, yes, I'm upset, blah, 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 right? It's about the patient. It's never about you. Guys, if you learn anything from me when it comes to therapeutic communication, you don't start that sentence with I because it's not about you. It's about the patient. So the fact that the first answer says, I am sorry, this is upsetting. Absolutely not. Look at two choice. The second choice. I'm happy only four people chose it. Why are you crying? 
you never say to a patient why or what made you. Those two, when you start a statement with those um, two words, either why or you say what made you, you're backing them into a corner. You're making them feel like they have to defend themselves and they're not going to want to open up to you. That's not therapeutic. And last, when you say think positive thoughts, I'm happy only four people chose that. Guess what? In nursing, we never give advice and we never use cliches. This patient is crying. They just got a diagnosis of leukemia and you're telling them to think happy thoughts. How's that going to get them to open up to you? Because when it comes to therapeutic communication, the whole point is to get that patient to want to express themselves to you. So you just make an observation. You seem terribly upset. All right, select all that apply. You're teaching safer sex practices to your patient that has just been tested positive for HIV. What information would you include? Select all that apply. So here are your choices of what you teach your patient. <sighs> Brush teeth after oral intercourse. Limit sexual partners to one. Use a condom for each sexual encounter. Never use condoms. Practice abstinence if possible or feasible. It's okay to share sexual toys. So there's more than one answer. You're teaching safer sex practices to your patient that's just been tested positive for HIV. Um, which instructions or education would you include? Okay. Um, wow. 21 of you chose brush teeth after oral intercourse. Although that is a hygienic practice, I would hope the patient does that. That is not part of the safer sex practices. So that's false. Limit sexual partners to one. Yes. You're going to limit the chance of exposure and transmission. So true. Use a condom after uh, with each sexual encounter. Absolutely. That also will, you know, limit the transmission. Absolutely. Never reuse condoms. Absolutely. That's nasty, by the way. Absolutely. You would teach that. Practice abstinence if possible or feasible. Absolutely. But telling the patient it's okay to share sexual toys, whoever that one person said, yes, stop it. Stop with the foolishness. Absolutely not. So. Um, correct on limiting sexual partners, not reusing condoms, using a condom every single time. And of course, uh, being abstinent if possible. All right. Your patient with aplastic anemia has a bone marrow transplant three weeks ago. Okay. So they had it three weeks ago. What's the nursing priority for this type of patient? Would it be to relieve their depression, to increase their nutrition, to prevent infection, or to increase hydration? Your patient had a bone marrow transplant three weeks prior. What would be your priority for this patient? The pin to enter is 987-434. Very good. Preventing infection. Here's the thing, guys. A bone marrow transplant, that's an invasive procedure. Anytime a patient has invasive procedure, the top three concerns, your priority is always going to be infection, hemorrhage, and DVT or pulmonary embolism. And out of those three that I just mentioned, the only one here that's an answer choice is infection, okay? We wanna prevent that patient from developing an infection. All right, your patient has a low platelet count. Which finding would reflect having a low platelet count? What would make you suspicious of a low platelet count? Would it be them having several bruises on their body? Would it be them having pale skin? Would it be them having an elevated core body temperature or would it be them having cool extremities? <clears throat> Very good, several bruises. So what do we know about platelets? Um, we know that platelets 
keep you from bleeding out, right? They keep, they keep you from hemorrhaging. Um, your normal plate account should be 150,000 to about 450,000. So anything lower than 150,000, that patient's going to be at risk for bleeding. You may see several bruises, okay? Patient with pale skin, that would be more likely like if the patient had um, decreased RBCs, right? Because, or they had decreased circulation, then their skin would be pale. Or let's look at elevated temperature. A patient has an elevated temperature. We see WBCs increase. WBC is supposed to be five to 10,000. Higher than 10,000, that lets us know that there's an infectious process happening with an elevated temperature. A patient has a fever. Most likely there's an infectious process happening. And then cool extremities. Patients got cool extremities. You're thinking what? Decreased circulation because what causes warmth to the skin when you're touching the extremities? What causes warmth? That blood flow right? So there's limited blood flow. Instead of those extremities being nice and warm, it may be cool. So that's what you'd be thinking of. But when it comes to a low plate account, think of um, possible bleeding and those signs and symptoms of uh, possible bleeding, such as that patient having several bruises. All right, guys, last question. Your patient with multiple myeloma is on high dose corticosteroids. Which statement by your patient reflects a complication of being on high dose corticosteroids? Would it be them saying, I'm getting lots of heartburn? Would it be them saying, I've been taking lots of naps lately? Would it be them saying, I don't have an appetite for food anymore? Or would it be them saying, my urine seems to be getting lighter and lighter? Which one would you associate with um, patient being on high dose corticosteroids? I'm getting lots of heartburn. Um, before I even touch the high dose steroids, I want to talk to you guys about something else. This is something I see many of you guys doing and you're getting easy questions wrong. You're getting questions that you know the answer, you know the information, but you're still choosing the wrong answer. And I'm going to tell you what you're doing. I want you to look at this question. Your patient with multiple myelomas on high dose cortical steroids, which statement um, by your patient reflects a complication. I cannot tell you how many students I've seen answer the question based on the diagnosis, which is multiple myeloma. Whenever you see a test question that has a diagnosis and a medication, a medication the patient just took or that they're, they're about to take, unless the question asks you specifically about the diagnosis, and usually they don't, guess what the question is asking you about the medication? That diagnosis is just thrown in there to confuse you. It's thrown in there. It's thrown in there to be a distractor to you. Okay. So don't fall for it. If you see a medication in the question, don't pay attention to that diagnosis. Pay attention to the medication unless the question specifically asks you about the diagnosis. Okay. So this question is asking us about what the medication, corticosteroids. What do we know about corticosteroids? We know four things for a fact. All right. When we're talking about steroids, the four things that need to be at the front, no, forefront of your mind. Number one, ulcers. Ulcers. Cortical steroids are very, very hard on the stomach. They can cause gastritis. That's why you never give cortical steroids on an empty stomach, right? So look, this patient having heartburn, what's really going on? Gastritis because of the high dose steroids. What's something else we know about steroids? hyperglycemia. They're very sugary. It can cause a patient to become diabetic. So you better be checking that patient's blood glucose. What's the third thing we know about steroids? Osteoporosis. They make the bones porous. So we're going to be concerned about falls. We're going to be concerned about that patient breaking bones. And what is the last thing we're going to be concerned about? Infection. When it comes to cortical steroids, they can mask the signs and symptoms of infection. So you have to monitor that patient much, much more closely. A tiny rise in temperature may indicate a very big infection that the patient has. So you better be checking that temperature. You better be checking the WBCs. If the patient's got a wound, you better be checking that wound. Is there a foul odor? Is there mucopurulent drainage? Is there redness, inflammation at the site? All those signs and symptoms of infection that you know about, you better be checking the patient very closely when they're on steroids. When it, whenever it comes to cortical steroids, don't forget those four things. Hyperglycemia, osteoporosis, ulcers, and what was the fourth thing I told you? Infection, those four. All right, guys, that is the end of this Kahoot. Let's see how you did.